I've been following this project, it seems, for 15 years. And the project goes even farther back than that. Um, this, this project started out where we, roughly where we're sitting used to be a, uh, a low-income housing, and next to it was a Wegmans grocery store. Unfortunately, Danny Wegmans and, uh, and Bill Johnson fought over expanding his grocery store on East Avenue. And in a response to that, because Bill Johnson wouldn't have the permits issued to allow that, Danny Wegmans closed the grocery store here in about 2008 or 9. Uh, the U of R saw that as an opportunity. They immediately bought the property and they wanted to build more office space on it for the hospital. Unfortunately, that was also something that Bill Johnson didn't want to see happen. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The, the, that property and all this property had been tax paying property. Uh, this had been this had been fairly this had this had not been inexpensive property and it paid a fair amount of taxes in the year in the year 1995 and to turn it over to U of R meant that it would never pay taxes again. So there was a strong push not to let that happen. The U of R drew up a plan to buy the whole area here and turn it into an office park for the hospital. Um, that was poorly received by the community and the government. So they, a different tack was tried because that opened the idea of what needs to happen here. Remember, it's now a parking lot, it's this low-income housing property, and it's a gas station. So the community got together and decided they were going to find out what the community wanted, and they did a bunch of surveys in 2008. And in these surveys, they went around knocking on doors and asking people what they wanted to happen here in this area. And when they were done, they tallied all up. And they came out with a list of things the community wanted. And top of that list was a grocery store. Because they wanted their Wegmans back. Okay? But they also wanted more green space. They wanted this section of, Monroe, of Mount Hope to be less congested and less of a problem for transportation, particularly for making left-hand turns. <laughs> they wanted more green space, they wanted a fitness center, they wanted a bus substation, they wanted a bookstore. And out of that <laughs> came college time. That survey in 2008 formed the basis for let's make college time. And so they got together and they put out a request and the U of R started looking at developers. And they looked down at a point, oh, I can't remember, right near the U of the RIT, uh, uh, Park Point, and they said, let's do that here, but not. The problem was, the U of R still wants office space here. They've always wanted it. They still want it. And Park Point doesn't bring them office space. But what they needed was they needed something that looked urban, that provided some of the things the community wanted, and would, in the end, allow them to have a lot of office space. And so what they did was they came up with this plan for College Town. And College Town, College Town was originally envisioned, if you look on the front page, is a mixed-use bookstore, grocery, hotel, conference center, shops, restaurants, office space, residential, fitness center, child care, transit station, parking garage. Oh, bells and whistles. Okay? This is, a, this is a great shopping list of things that, quite simply, you're not going to find here. And very specifically, they said early on, this was not going to be a college bookstore. <laughs> Which if you walk through, it's it is a college bookstore. <laughs> so once the plan was finalized and the public was on board, the next step was how to pay for it. And Wait, how'd they get the public on board if they weren't 
the, because they were going to have a oh, grocery okay. store, a bookstore, a hotel, a conference center. They were going to have all these things, which, if you go back to the 2008 yeah. survey, were exactly what the community wanted. Good PR. Have you talked to Dana Miller about these things? Uh, Dana was at the meetings in which I blew up at. Yeah, because, so, yeah I just was he. Had, he saw this. Um, yeah, I just wonder what he uh, um, back, back, they did many meetings about this. I showed up at a meeting in 2012 and I blew up and told them this is all a farce and they're not getting any of these things. And I could go, it's all about parking in my mind. There's insufficient parking for a hundred, there's insufficient parking for a hotel, a grocery store, the bookstore, 150 apartments, and any office space. It just, there's no parking for that. And you don't build this, even with the parking garage. There's no parking for that. Saying nothing of the restaurant and all the other stuff. So that can't be the plan. Because you wouldn't build something without sufficient parking. And like always, the plan here was to turn this into office space. But we'll get to that. How do you finance a project like this? The, their plan was it was gonna cost more than $100 million. Uh, and it ended up running around 109. The, uh, to pay for this, to pay for this, the, uh, 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 the city, had this, uh, they got all the government agencies on board. But most of these things I'm going to mention all required the city's cooperation to get. So they got a $20 million section 108 loan. They got a $5.4 million, it's not in there. They got a $5.4 million new market tax credit from the federal government. They got brownfield cleanup money. They got sales tax credits, which are my favorite. The sales tax credits mean when something is so the first $2.7 million of sales tax paid at this property go to the building. Um, the uh, uh, state grant, they got a state grant through the Finger Lakes Regional Council. Uh, the city gave them a $3.4 million grant, of course, can't get enough money from the city. And uh, the city paid them $3 million to build Celebration Drive. Um, then, as if that wasn't enough, in 2004, this street and the intersection at Elmwood had been completely redone. So in 2013, it's only nine years old, they tore it all up. There you go. That was a problem. Put in all new sidewalks, redid all the curbing, did all the infrastructure again because it didn't have the water and the sewer to support this. Uh, put in new uh, utilities because it didn't have enough electrical and gas for all of this. And the city did all that for them for free. City expense. About $15 million because they screwed it up and had to do it twice. So, um, uh, it, now, a couple of these I really want to point out, and that's the two of them in particular. Now, the city actually has to sign off on the Section 108 loan, the new, house, the new market tax credits, the brownfield cleanup, the sales tax, the grant it's giving, the money for the thing. The only thing they didn't have to sign off for is the $4 million from the Finger Lakes Regional Council, whose president at the time was Joel Siegelman. <laughs> President of the U of R basically gave four million dollars to his own project. Not that there was a conflict of interest, and not that our papers covered that. So, the uh, all the rest of the public money, forty million dollars, we all had to get the approval and in some way go through the city of Rochester. Um, now, the two biggest ones, the 108 loan, a TUD section 108 loan is supposed to go to only very specific uses. And uh, the program is for projects that benefit moderate and low income persons, uh, prevent or eliminate slums or bright light, address community development needs with particular urgencies, because existing condition pose a serious and imminent health or health problem, or provide a service that's provide a service lacking in a low-income area. 
Now, this is not a low income area. Within a mile, almost everything here can be found. There was no new services actually being provided. It met none of the criteria for a HUD 108 low. No. The new market housing tax credits are supposed to be, the new market tax credits is to spur revitalization in low income and impoverished communities. Look out there. Go drive around the hospital. Nothing here is low income. You know, this is not a low income area. They misused those two. $25.5 million of money was misused to build this. Is that authorized by one individual or is there a department that's responsible? HUD has to sign off on it, but as far as I can tell, if the city signs off on it, HUD always signs off on no, it. I'm asking about the city. Is there an individual or is there a department that has to sign off on it? Probably the head of uh, uh, housing and business development signs off on it. I honestly am not completely certain on that. The, uh, um, but the best thing about this is the loan, the 108 loan, was supposed to be paid back out of taxes. There's a whole formula worked out under revenue on page two, which says that it will increase the assessment, it will provide $332,000 of revenue the first year and $6.6 .6 million over 20 years, uh, over 20 years in interest income. Uh, uh, the total thing will provide 200000 annually for the first seven years. And uh, uh, the problem with this is we are now in year four of this project. And this year and last year, it paid $30,027. The loan repayment for the HUD 108 loan is $1.2 million a year, paid for out of taxes leaving a $1.197 million shortfall, which is made up out of general revenues from the city. So we are all paying back this loan that went to build this project. And this project's taxes aren't going up because it's only paying the easements, which if you don't know what an easement is, I suggest you spend a lot of time trying to find it. It's a, uh, certain taxes are assigned to specific projects, like street snow plowing and things like that. Those are called easements. Those easements are all this property is paying. It's not paying any tax revenue at all. In churches, everybody pays easements. So, in effect, no tax revenue is being gotten out of this property. And the funny thing is, in 2012, this prop, these properties here were paying $35,000, $5,000 more than they are paying today. Even though this $109 million project is being assessed at $30 million. That's kind of a crime in and of no itself. There was no debt to the city, correct? What? There was no debt to the city, or to the taxpayers. It was purely revenue, is that correct? And the $35,000 that was being paid, it was Purely revenue to the city? And uh, it's purely easements, so it's purely paying for specific projects. There's no debt repayment on any of the loans that okay. have gone on at all. So we, the public, are paying the entire loan. We'll start there and we'll go to you, Bob. How, how, so how are they not paying taxes? How are they getting around? No big the property pay, pays taxes. You haven't been listening to me. No big property pays taxes. Oh, I, I, downtown. Yes. Well, I know they, I mean, how do they get away with it? Um, well, what they, well, what they have done here is the U of R has bought the property. It was supposed to be owned by the developer, and then there was disagreement that taxes would be paid, but in the second year, the property was sold to the U of R, and the city would have to file some paperwork about a prior claim for revenues owed, which they failed to file. So, as a result, the debt repayment on the loans are not going to happen. Yeah, and this goes over several mayors. I mean, that's, you know what I'm saying? It's not like one screwed up. No, it's not brand two new. Two screwed up. No, well, I don't have to do No, but yeah, she's right. This starts with Duffy. Yeah, it's not. Like and goes through Richards. Which is 
and goes into lovely Ward's administration. Oh, I, I have no question. Yeah. Well, City Council was well yeah. aware of it. City Council and Rochester Economic Development yes. yeah. and Carl Carvalata, they were involved from day one. And maybe that's why it doesn't answer your question. Yeah. I mean, that's really the big I mean, here. If everybody's not looking because they chose not to look, mm -hmm. and that's a standard, and because the way they, they get this money and in investments and everything is kind of like most people, most people in the city, up until when we started talking about this, had not a clue as to what corporate welfare was. Not a right. clue. So right. just just think of that for a while. And oh yeah. Kind of put the figures the, I came the very close to getting an getting an article in the city newspaper on this. Came this close, but the city and Dana Miller and Carlos Carvalhada and other people called them and unofficially. They were threatened with loss of advertising revenue if they published the story. No. So, um, and and um, uh, I had said at the time, and I said at City Council when they were voting on this in 2012, the city would never get this 20 million dollars back. That if we gave this loan, we would be on the hook for that 20 million dollars, and we, the citizens of Rochester, would repay that. And that is exactly what has happened. And um, so, so this is a tremendous pile of corporate welfare. And you would think that you would think that filing paperwork to maintain your interest for payment would be something the city could do. Yeah. <clears throat> you would think that could not be just missed as a mistake. But I have to say, I have to say that my experience with city lawyers over the years makes me believe that it possibly could have been a mistake. They're that bad. But also, I would not doubt that this was done intentionally to not file, to not put the money in here. And um, the uh, the the thing about this project is that at no point did this make sense. Um, the, uh, everything they used to sell this, from the uh, starting with the jobs, they said this project's going to create 584 jobs full time. From the very beginning, this bookstore here was going to cost jobs, not add jobs. Because the plan from the very beginning was to close the college bookstore over at the Douglas Building and the hospital bookstore. So they were going to close two bookstores, consolidate them here, and they were going to lose employees in that. So from the very beginning, the very first thing, they were going to. Now, um, if it's not raining, let's go outside for a minute. And it's interesting if we look, we're going to walk down this way. The second business we go to is the U of R. Right off the bat. Right off the bat, we run into U of R Hospital has moved something over to here rather than having it on the hospital facilities. They're not intending, they're, and, and this is going to be a continual trend here, is they move more and more things that they can over here rather than having them in the hospital because the U of R is the board, which is incorporating everything in all space. And uh, the, uh, if now, now I want to draw attention to the creator's hands. Um, the creator's hands is the closest thing we have here to a small boutique business. And it may actually be, it kind of is, I won't make fun of it. Um, Almost everything else in this stretch, and we're going to move along, is we come to cookies, and we come to bars, and we come to restaurants. All the same businesses drop in. Oh, yeah. And of course, of course, the vacant area. According to the contract for College Town, according to the contract for College Town, this is very important. This property has to be retail. The uh, grocery store had to be a grocery store. But if they are unable to fill it for one year, they can put whatever reasonably makes sense to put into that. So, 
Within one year, if this remains vacant and they can't fill it, the U of R can move anything they want in here. Because that's the way it's written on the contract. So that's why they pay those lawyers the big bucks. What? Why they pay the lawyers the big bucks. Oh yeah. You know, they even interestingly argued at one point that what happened at Sibley's couldn't happen here because our lawyers are so much better than they were then. And I see every mistake that was made. And in fact, Sibley's building downtown got away without paying millions of dollars. And they're doing the same thing in a slightly different way. It should have been obvious to anyone looking at the contracts. The question. Oh no, no, this is the problem. The community was so involved in this project. They were so for it because they were getting a grocery store in a fitness center in a bus state in a bus station. <coughs> And the child care center in more green space. And this road was going to be fixed and we could make left hand turns with that medium down the middle. But they weren't at the table when all the. No, but they kept having all the meetings, they kept informing them, they kept saying, one at a time, all the things fell off. You know, they'd have a meeting and they'd say, well, we've been unable to find, we, we tried really hard to get the Y to open up something here. We've looked at the downtown recreation center. We've contacted a bunch of places. No one wants to open a fitness thing here. So unless someone comes into the picture, we're going to have to knock that off the list. Shouldn't that have been something that they did before they went ahead with the project? Oh, no. Construction had already started. Um, right, but when you promise the community what the community was asking for, should that not have been part of the prerequisite list of things before they went ahead with the project. Okay, what you pro and this is the problem with development in Rochester. They're willing to promise the community anything the community wants because they know down the road they won't be held accountable. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people living in this area who say this is nicer than the low income housing in the vacant lot and that awful looking very gas important. station. That's a very important and this building is not ugly. Okay? It's not gorgeous. Okay? It's like a lot of That's not gorgeous. But it's not ugly. Not as bad as what was here. Yeah. Right. And that's a very and, small and so a lot. at the that. end of the day, this is still gonna be nicer than what was yeah. here. And the people were hopeful. And you heard this all the time in every single meeting. Well, we've got to do something, and at least we have some say on what's going here. We've been involved. And they, no, they were. They were so involved. You should have seen the fight they had to stop the uh, drive through over at the Tim Hortons. OK? They lost, of course. <laughs> but they were very involved. And you know, the problem is they can do this they did the exact opposite of what the neighbors wanted with the neighbors sitting there the whole time. And well, and that's that, why we need to create another party because a lot of this is, is just crap. And when you have, not that there's a magic wand or anything, but when you have people who will make sure that these things are watched and will pull the community in, honestly, this is not easy stuff to do, really. Well, which one? That, that's, that's an important piece, though. College Town, expect yeah. more. U of R. Yeah. It just didn't fit on the sign. <laughs> the, uh, there you go. Um, this, is our, this is our bus station right here. <laughs> wow. we, they were promised that the first floor of the parking garage is supposed to be a bus station, it's supposed to be able to take 10 buses. This is what the bus station became. This shelter, and I believe another shelter further down. That has become the bus station. Now, the bus is important because there's not enough parking. And in no time was there enough parking. And one of the problems was there's all these apartments up above. And the apartments up above, 150 of them, which which started rent and which start rent at uh, at uh, fifteen hundred dollars a month affordable housing.
comes and go up to, I believe, 2750, uh, go up to 2750, are symptomatic of what is actually going on here and one of the reasons for all the vote for open spaces. The rent here is ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. The contract that was signed at Brooks Landing specified a rent price for retail. This one did not. They're trying to get $28 a square foot. Oh. Now to put that in perspective, on Monroe Avenue, we figure, and this is per year, per square foot, on Mon for those who don't know retail. On Monroe Avenue, we like to get $15 a square foot. Yes. And Monroe Avenue is a thriving commercial corridor. So this may actually be slightly better. They may be able to officially expect 17. But what they're charging is ridiculous. And the reason they can get away with this well, and this is a common thing in retail. If you own a lot of retail space, some of it will be rented, some of it will be not. You get to write off your loss in rent on the place that's not rented against the profits from the places that are rented. So there is a ratio of rented to not rented that maximizes your profits. And so, it, a large place like this, having 15 to 20% vacancy, doesn't actually cut into their profits one bit. It may actually increase them. And now, because it's owned by the U of R, it's not as big a deal, because they're not for profit. Which brings me to some numbers again, because I love numbers. Um, there are 150 apart apartments here that should rent for about three and a half million dollars. There is 100,000 square feet of office space, which we'll rent in the neighborhood for $3 million. There's 110,000 square feet of retail, which we'll rent for in the neighborhood of $3 million. There is also a parking garage, which will get the, between half a million and a million a year. And I have no idea, because I can't figure out how the hotel fits into the whole thing and how they make money out of that. But I'm certain they're making money off the hotel. When all is said and done, somewhere between 10 and $12 million is being made in this space. If they got a mortgage for the, not, for the $100 million, and they paid taxes on the property, about $3.2 million, the, the mortgage would be about $4 million, the taxes would be about three. million, that's about $7 million. They'd still make $5 million on this property. still profitable even if they paid all their expenses. But yet they always make the argument that without the public funding, this cannot happen. And and the $5 million profit, the, the 3 to $5 million profit on this property would still be a 3 to 5% profit for something owned by a not-for-profit. You would think that wasn't doable. Hey, let's look at Celebration Drive. <laughs> I'm gonna turn the corner for the quiet. Now, when they started this construction project, they needed a road to bring all the trucks in. They needed to have a way to access the middle of the site so they could do their construction. And that road was right here, okay? Like most construction roads, it was packed dirt with some gravel down, good foundation. And it also was the location of much of the electric and water services that ran in because they put them in first. So all of that ran down here. After this project was about half done, the city said, you know, we need a road running in here on property completely owned by the U of R. We paid to have the road finished and paid the full cost of constructing the road and then some. And just for fun, what do you think a road? You see the building down there, the big tower? It only runs to there. 
What do you think that costs? What's the cost to build this road, which is about a quarter of a mile? What? what was the cost or what was paid? There's what was what is the what do you think was paid? Seven billion. You are tied. Only three million dollars. It was a deal for this quarter of a million quarter of a mile stretch. And uh, this is just more money pumped into the construction project. And my, one of the big selling points of the construction project is right up here across the street. This was where the grocery store was, built to be the grocery store. And this was the big selling point that the community kept going back to. As they lost their fitness center, their child care, their bus terminal, their green space, they always had this grocery store to fall back on. Now, rather than getting a local company to run it, the developer, who was from Cleveland, brought in a grocery store chain that he owned to move in here and set up shop for one year, which was the duration the they needed a grocery store on the place. And at the one year anniversary, they closed. The store was never set up to succeed. It was never set up to cater to the audience in the area. None of that mattered. It, the shelves were almost never full because why bother? They'd never had enough staff. And what was the key to me of why this grocery store was going to fail? There's not enough parking. If we walk down here, the uh, grocery stores need a tremendous amount of parking. Just a tremendous amount of parking. I should point out green space. Look, yeah, you green. Know what? I'll enjoy it. Look, there's some green space. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> well, I can't get over how if much. If I had kids, they could play here. Yeah, yeah, by the way, think about it. At the, uh, almost a little playground. <laughs> there's three trees in a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somewhat smaller than me. Could. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. This parking lot was the parking lot for the grocery store. Parking spaces. And for the people who live in the residences of this block. Okay? There was no possibility at all, if you think about when people shop, they shop at the same time that people are back. And there, this parking lot would have needed to, and look, it's almost full now. Okay? because the people who live here park here. So if it's full now, when was there gonna be spaces for the grocery patrons? A grocery store, as I said, needs tremendous amount of parking. It wasn't here. They made no effort and no one is gonna carry their groceries a long distance to get to a car or a bus. They want the location to be right there. If we look, we're not, we have walked from where the bus drops off, down Celebration Drive, over, and the entrance was over here to get to the grocery store. That's a, that, that is a fairly far distance for someone who's expected to take a bus. I guess it doesn't fit into the category of convenience store. Right. But well, if the they person. wanted to cater to college students at the U of R, most of whom would ride buses. And there's no way, the way it's even set up for a bus to come in and loop around. This is not set up in any way to make this a possible situation. And, and a friend of mine worked on the construction of this building. And I want to point out this column right here. Because this is absolutely crucial to understanding the entire project. This is a solid construction column faced in brick. The, uh, the size of this 
and it is three feet square of reinforced concrete and steel story, to support a one-story building. A one-story building. Yeah, or a high-rise that's planned down the road. It is go. actually yeah. constructed to allow them to expand yeah. this grocery store to seven floors. <laughs> A seven-floor grocery store. It will be the first in the nation if yeah, it had succeeded. Like the, store, one the, store. Uh, the, the craziness of that shows that from the very beginning, the plans for this called for this to never be a grocery store. Never. It called for this to be a grocery store for the one year required, to be vacant for the one year required, and to eventually become office space for the U of R, who would love a seven-story tower right here. Where we stand. Fit into the category of fraud? Uh, fraud would require that we didn't know it was happening. <laughs> and, and, you know, I told City Council this was going on. No one cares. So, uh, yeah, and this building, this building, um, I was told they, the concrete footers at each of the corners and along the side are designed to, uh, uh, to hold a seven floor steel steel structured uh, building uh, uh, similar to that one right over there so future office space for future office space for the U of O the uh, the, CV, the empty CVS that I pointed out at the first corner when we walked out the door has now moved to the back corner over here and one of the problems with our development in all of them is that we frequently are just moving a business from one location across the street to another location. We pay CVS money to help them move their business across the street. Because Can I get help moving? That's the way we work in the city. I don't know what the total amount was, but there was funds made available for them to relocate. Relocation funds were made available. We're going to um, start heading back because I'm... I've stopped here for two reasons. The first is this building. On the first floor, there's some retail, no big deal. But above it is office space. This is... And the U of R, the, the, the project has all, had always called for some amount of office space to be included into the project. Yeah, I finally figured that out. And this is, uh, uh, this office space, from the very beginning, the, there was a plan people wanted, the, the people in the neighborhood did not mind the idea that there would be some office space here. They wanted the office space built like this, so that there'd be some retail, then some office space above you wouldn't see. The problem is the way the contract is written is retail could all vanish. And, and like this building, notice the even larger columns at the corner of this building, four foot, not three foot here, um, allows this building to go up nine floors or higher. <laughs> Because again, beyond behind this brick is, is solid reinforced concrete and steel girders, allowing them at the very top to pop a section off the roof and add another, and add another six to se six or seven floors right above this. The whole idea has always been to, as they can, expand this to be as much office space as they can. Over here is the Hilton Gardens Hotel. Hilton Gardens has 180 rooms in this hotel, supposedly. The uh, parking requirements for 180, the parking requirements for a 180, uh, um, uh, 180 room hotel in the city of Rochester is 270 spots. <coughs> they must be dedicated to, according to city. And as I look out here, I notice what is not 270 spots? One of the things you must keep in mind is that any project of this size, when you're pouring $100 million into it, needs to make sense. The project has to work. 
because they're putting out a fair amount of money. Even with all the public financing, they still have $30 million into this. <coughs> if it doesn't look like it makes sense, it's because you're not seeing it correctly. It's not that it's not going to work. They're not stupid. It's that, it, it's that the parking, all the rest of this, they're assuming is going to have basically no parking. And that is because it's going to be U of our offices. And you know that because of the lack of parking. Now, there is a parking garage. As we see, that is for the residents of this building in front of us. A large number of the tenants all have parking underneath so that they don't park out here. This is parking only for the retail businesses and the hotel. How many spaces in the garage? You would think I'd have that number written down because I have seen it. Um, down here is a parking garage. I don't see any reason to walk there. We can see it from here. It was originally sold as a three-floor parking garage. If you look over there and count, you will notice five. Like, like, at no point did they ever come clean to the public and tell them there would be five floors to the parking garage. They just kept building. And in the building of that parking garage, a crane broke and they dropped uh, one of the panels of the poured reinforced concrete uh, decking and uh, uh, delayed construction and did uh, quite a bit of damage. Um, that's just an interesting side note to me uh, uh, because there aren't that many broken cranes nationally every year and these are big cranes. Let's just be thankful nobody was hurt or uh, killed. It's amazing that no one was hurt or killed as busy as they were working on this. But uh, uh, that garage, that, uh, that garage was originally supposed to be a structure with a uh, with a uh, uh, a bus state terminal on the ground floor. It was supposed to have docking space for 10 buses. It was supposed to have an indoor space for people waiting for bus exchanges. It was supposed to have an interchange for the U of R bus services to the RGRTA bus services. It was a it was supposed to have uh, even a direct handicap shuttle service to the hospital from there for those who were able to walk the extra distance but were on outpatient and didn't actually want to qualify, didn't qualify for ambulance service. The only thing that's there is the parking it's garage. It's a parking garage. And, and, and despite RGRTA believing they were getting this and uh, deciding that they didn't need to make the downtown bus terminal larger because they were going to have this substation here. Now remember, the downtown bus station, all the buses don't fit inside. And they don't fit inside because there was supposed to be a substation here. And buses were supposed to be able to drop off and pick up and it would cut down in the number of buses you would need in bays downtown was supposed to be here. They drew their plans for that and started working on that, believing this was going to happen and then got screwed because the U of R, the, t the builder determined they couldn't come to an agreement because the builder kept raising the price for what it would cost to do this. And the U of R stepped in and said, well, I don't want this project to go down. We'll buy the whole first floor parking and the fourth and the fifth floor which weren't even in the plants. Huh. I believe they can add two more floors there the way it's built. I think they constructed it to add two more floors. Like many things here, okay, they're very compartmentalized and buildable up. Uh, almost as if there was a plan to put more here from the very beginning. And the U of R came in, bought up the ground floor, it kicked the RGRTA, substation out and uh, and in uh, as a result the U of R bought that garage for 16 million dollars basically 
they got the right to the entire garage as part of the U of R parking services. And uh, it is basically 100% U of R parking. Ground floor, the U of R buying the ground floor. Okay, the U of R bought the ground floor of that garage for $16 million and have leveraged that to control of the entire garage. The end result of all of this is that U of R has gotten what it always wanted. Back in 2000, roughly, the U of R had a plan to turn this whole space into an office park with additional parking for the hospital, dorm rooms for the medical students and graduate students. And what they have done is they have put in some fairly expensive housing which is used mainly for students of the U of R and a bunch of space that's rapidly turning into office with a parking garage and all this has been done half of the entire project has been paid for with our money and the project is completely tax free and as was pointed out at one point this doesn't go to one person this was not the result of corruption in one government official because this project started under the Duffy administration run entirely through the Richard administration and through the Warren administration everyone is culpable for what has happened here and interestingly if you ask the three administrations at least two of them at least the Warren administration and the Richard administration would say they don't act the same, they don't agree on the same thing, they have huge disagreements. Except when it comes to this. When it comes to using your money to build projects for large development and make them tax free, all our government officials agree that's the way to best serve you, the public.